Thank you, Herman, for those very nice words. Thank you to the uh, committee as well for awarding me this fantastic honor. It's really, really a great uh, uh, prestigious prize. I'm very, very happy with it. I must add to the story that I was trained in chemistry at Utrecht University, so I'm not <laughs> that, that old out, perhaps. So I'd like to discuss with you today briefly, before we go to lunch, um, the main uh, focus of my work, which was also uh, explained by, uh, by Herman. If you want to understand the processes that underlie the, uh, the living cell, then it is extremely useful to study the three-dimensional atomic structures of the protein machines that catalyze the reactions that go on inside the cell. And this was in a fundamental way explained by, by, by the first speaker this morning and then and beautifully illustrated with movies by, by the second one afterwards. Now, for many years, the tools available to the structural biologists to do this, the major one was X-ray crystallography, and NMR spectroscopy has also played a role for smaller complexes and perhaps more dynamic ones. Now, recently, a third technique has emerged, and uh, that is uh, cryo-electron microscopy, or cryo-M in short. And in my group, we study methods to improve this, uh, this uh, structure determination efforts. Now, in the background uh, of my title slide, you can see a picture that was taken in an electron microscope. It's a purified solution of ribosomes, so you do not need to crystallize them. And you, you make a very thin layer of, of the solution uh, by blotting away excess liquid. And then you quickly freeze it into liquid ethane, so quick that the, the water has not time to crystallize and you get, rid, you, you get left with vitreous form of, of solid water. And then you can put it in a transmission electron microscope and take these images. And each of the little black dots in the background is a two-dimensional projection image, we call them particles, of, of an individual ribosome uh, machine. And because they were tumbling in solution in random ways at the moment that the sample was frozen, there will be different two-dimensional views of, of supposedly the same three-dimensional object in many different orientations. So this is complementary 2D information that be, can be combined in a single 3D reconstruction. The way that works is, is perhaps best explained through the, the projection slice theorem. This will be the only theorem I will explain today. If you have a three-dimensional object, you can calculate the three-dimensional Fourier transforms, just a simple mathematical operation. You could go back and forwards. Now, in the, in the microscope, we calculate what's called X-ray projections because it's very much like sticking your hand in an X-ray machine in the hospital in that the electrons go through the, the, the macromolecular complex and you get a true transmission picture. Now, that kind of projection images, you can take a two-dimensional Fourier transform, and now the theorem says that this, this 2D transform is actually a central slice through the 3D transform of the, of the original 3D object. And the, and the orientation of that slice is then perpendicular to the direction that the projections were taken in. So that if we would know all the relative orientations of these two-dimensional views of the ribosomes, then we can put all these two-dimensional projections in the, inside the three-dimensional Fourier transform and then just do an inverse transform to get the three-dimensional reconstruction. So that's what we do. Now, it turns out that as with many many ways of imaging in, in the life sciences that, that radiation damage, damage to the, the thing we're actually looking at by the actual light, or in this case, electrons that we use to, to look at them with, is the main limitation. And it was Richard Henderson, at the, at also at the MRC in Cambridge, who already more than 20 years ago predicted that the, the, uh, if you would do everything else perfect, then the main limitation, radiation damage, would not keep you from being able to do this to atomic, say, three angstrom-like resolution, not truly atomic, but enough to build the de novo model, uh, from as little as 10,000 of these particle views. And this number was later uh, adjusted downwards to several hundred particles. And you could do that for as, as, as particles as, as small as 100,000 dal Daltons. Now, for many years, Richards was considered rather the optimist, and the reason for that is kind of highlighted in this plot by the black, uh, the cloud of black points, which are all 21st century structures downloaded from the electron microscopy data bank from the year 2000 to the year 2012. And 
what I plot on the x-axis is, is molecular size, because the larger something is, the easier it is to, it to see in any microscope, also an electron microscope. It, it becomes easier to determine the top and the side and the front view, so you can put those two transforms back together. On the, on the y-axis is resolution, so how much detail can you see in the structures? And you can see that for the bulk of them, resolution gets limited to about 10 to 20 angstroms, and at that kind of resolution, individual protein domains are visible as blobs. So you can study quaternary protein structure, but not atomic models. And it's only in, in recent years, and those are the red points at the top, that we are now able to reach uh, near three angstrom resolution maps, or even now beyond three angstroms, uh, for, uh, for complexes of, of a wide range in, in, in size. So that raises, of course, the question, what happens? And there's two answers to this question. And I think the, uh, the, the first one, and perhaps most important one, is the development of better detectors. Because together with his predictions, Richard realized that the actual, we're not doing things perfectly. And we were taking our pictures on photographic film. And besides being very cumbersome, it's also not a very good detector. And that's on the plot on the left, where DQE, you can think of it as the efficiency with which you detect the electrons that hit the detector. And photographic film in gray shows you only detect approximately one out of three electrons. Now, that's bad news, because I told you that radiation damage is the limiting factor in, in this kind of imaging. So that means that we have to strictly limit the number of electrons that we put on the sample to, to see it. So if we limit it strictly and then throw away two-thirds of the, of the electrons in our detection process, then uh, we're, we're throwing away a lot of useful information in somewhere which, which is really limiting. So Richard, and then it was also followed up by others in, in the States, started to develop new digital detectors that can detect electrons directly. And this has recently led to the marketing by three different companies of direct electron detectors, which are digital chips. And the best ones are this Falcon and the K2. The Falcon is made across the road at FEI company, which used to be Philips. And they can now detect more or less one out of every two electrons. So we've gone from one, to th one out of three to one to two. But that has made a major improvement, as I will explain briefly. Now, the second. Uh, a major advance in the field is more closer to my own work, and that's the uh, development of better image processing algorithms. And there's two aspects of this which I will, which I'll, um, which I'll discuss in a minute. So I like to, to, to illustrate the effect of direct detectors on, uh, on, on our field with uh, just a picture taken on a normal personal photographic camera, because the, the photographic camera has gone a similar evolution as the electron detectors. And these are my two favorite particles. They're called Jan and Matt. And this is a, a rather atypical sunny day in Cambridge. Now, it's not only atypical in Cambridge, it's also atypical in the electron microscope because I just told you that we have to limit the amount of electrons we use to uh, image our particles because otherwise they will be burned away. So they're very sensitive to the light we image them with and we have to take pictures in the dark. Now, if you would do this on your old-fashioned photographic film camera, it might uh, perhaps look like this. Now imagine you have a better digital chip, which is more sensitive to the light, and you can just p make pictures which are just a little bit better. But this difference could just be the difference between being able to say this is a front view or a top view or a side view, and thereby you can put that two-dimensional transform in the 3D transform and start to average out noise by just adding in more data. Now, this is still uh, an optimistic uh, point, uh, point of view, because what really happens in a microscope is this. Once the electrons hit the sample, they start to move around. So we're taking pictures in the dark of a moving object. And I'll just switch the light on so we can see what's happening. But we're, if we t do this on our, on our normal photographic film and a half second exposure, we we'll of course get a very blurry picture. And that happens exactly the same with the molecules in our, in our microscope. The electrons hit them, they start to move around. Now, fortunately, these new detectors, the, the chip development is rather parallel with, with those of, uh, in your mobile phones. And if you now have an iPhone, you can put it into burst mode and you can take pictures. You can take a series of pictures which uh, explains the motion, but each of the pictures has such a short exposure that the actual object that is moving is now much sharper. Now, this is how it looks in, in real life. Things are a bit more uh, grayish with molecules, and it's all very noisy, and that's because we use so little electrons in order not to damage our, 
our uh, sample that the images come up very noisy. This is a single uh, highlighted, a single 2D projection view of a ribosome, and we call this very beautiful. And it's actually the average of 16 movie frames, so of our burst mode uh, movie that we made. And the 16 movie frames look like this, and it's actually very, very hard to distinguish the ribosomes in this because the, the electron dose in each of the frames is now 1 16th of the, of, the, of the average of the movie. So hidden in, this, in these high levels of noise are sharp pictures of ribosomes, sharp at the atomic level, and the, and the only task at hand is to get that information out into a 3D reconstruction. So that's where my work comes in, and I've written this program called uh, RelyOn. It's based on a uh, Bayesian inference uh, f statistical framework, and I will, I will spare you the details before lunch. I'll only say that the important thing is that critical signal-to-noise parameters that, that, that are part of your data are being estimated from the data themselves, and you don't have to supervise this in any way. And that w takes away part of the user uh, expertise or, or user intervention that was, was perhaps necessary in, in more traditional uh, approaches to, to this problem. And that ultimately results in objectivity. And it actually results then in very good uh, uh, reconstructions of the scattering potential of all the atoms in, in a structure without the people do using the program actually having to be an expert. Now, one thing that this program does well, and which has been cause of this revolution, is this correction of movement. And we can now follow these ribosomes throughout the pictures that we take. Some pictures are actually surprisingly good. On the left is a picture uh, which, where the ribosomes hardly move at all. They move from the green to the red dot, which are actually blown up, a factor of 25 for you to see something. But they hardly move at all on the left, yet on the right they move uh, a lot more. This picture is somehow much worse. And they also seem to move in all kinds of different directions. They seem to kind of move around. And we don't really understand the physics behind the movement or what exactly is going on. But at least now we can start to, to analyze these movements and uh, correct for them, and perhaps even uh, design methods to try and stop them from moving so we could get much sharper pictures uh, to start with. Now, then we showed that for if you do this beam-induced motion correction, you can then get near-atomic three angstrom-like or uh, uh, resolution uh, reconstructions from only several tens of thousands of these particle images. And uh, then it becomes exciting because you can build de novo atomic models in, inside these reconstructions. Now, another, and that's the second aspect of image processing development that I'd like to discuss with you, is the fact that all these protein complexes, they're really like macromolecular machines. So they use movement of their individual domains relative to each other, lever motions, rotations, etc., as a, as a critical way of how they actually work. And if these machines do that at the moment that we freeze them, then you'll end up with, with three-dimensional objects, which are all different because they're in different state. A lever arm might swing around or an axis might be in different rotational states. And if you would do a single reconstruction of all of those together, then the moving parts would all be blurred out. Now, and this is work already started when I was uh, in Madrid in, in 2006. Um, we, we, dis we developed a method where we start from random subsets of data and then uh, com do, do competitive alignments of particles. I will not go into the detail, but what ends up, if you do this inside such st statistical framework, you can actually take a data set, which is many ten thousands or perhaps hundred thousands or millions of individual particle images, and divide them into into a discrete number of subsets, each of which could then describe one of the structures that happens inside your sample. And we did this first, again, for a ribosome. I hope you still have some patience for ribosomes. And, and we, we separated ribosomes, which had three tRNAs, from, from ones that only had one plus an elongation factor. And this was exciting because for the first time, we were able, without any supervision of saying what, what's actually different in the sample, to, to, to disentangle which of these very noisy 2D projections corresponds to this type of, to the three tRNA type ribosomes or to the EFG type ribosomes. And to some extent, uh, that opens very exciting possibilities where if you have mixtures, 
the classical structural biology approach would be the chemical one, the biochemical one, where you use purification, biochemical purification, to separate distinct structures out into do two different samples on which you would do uh, structural biology or biophysics experiments. To some extent, we can now circumvent that by actually imaging mixtures, as long as in the computer we are able to to separate out the distinct structures. We can get structures of all of the different 3D states from one single experiment. And just as an example that where we actually did this is a project together with Venki Ramakrishnan at the LMB, and this was his postdoc, Alexei Amunds. He worked on, on yeast mitochondrial ribosomes, and he purified mitochondrial membranes and then to the cytoplasmic side of them were stuck lots of cytoplasmic ribosomes. And he asked us, I have a lot of cytoplasmic ribosomes in my sample. Should I purify this more? Should it go back to the wet lab? We said, well, let's have a look. And, and Xiao Chen, a postdoc in my lab, imaged 100,000 of these particles and showed you can, by image classification, beautifully separate out the 30% cytoplasmic ribosomes from the 70% mitochondrial ones. And from 50,000 of the best particles, we calculated a three angstrom map in which we could de novo model build the entire mitochondrial ribosome structure. Now, just f as a final example of what is possible now is a, a, is a project that we've done uh, over the last two years in the lab, again, mainly driven by Xiao Chen Bai, my postdoc, and it's on gamma secretase. Now, gamma secretase uh, is provided to us by Yi Gong Shi, who's at Tsinghua University. And it is a protease that lives inside the membrane. It's actually a complex of four different proteins, and it cuts other proteins, that's what proteases do, and it cuts many different ones, but two of the most famous ones are the notch receptor and the amyloid precursor protein. And if those two pathways go wrong, you end up with either cancer on one hand or, or Alzheimer's disease on the other hand. So this has been a very important target for drug development in the pharmaceutical industry for many years. Yet, because it is a, a, a membrane complex of four different proteins, each of which have at least a, a transmembrane helix, one of the domains of, a, of one of the compounds, nicastrin, is very heavily glycosylated. And this together makes it a very hard challenge for crystallization attempts. And people have tried for decades without much success. Yet, also for the CRIAM point of view, it is not an easy project. And some people, when we started this, would thought this was, was actually too difficult because it's only 170 kilodaltons worth of protein. And we didn't really know how it looked. And it, it, it was a general challenge for CRIAM as well. Yet, earlier this year, Xiao Chen was able to, to generate a 3.4 angstrom reconstruction of the entire complex. And we can now uh, de novo build an atomic model of all the four proteins involved. At 3.4 angstrom in the cryam map, you can see all of the amino acid side chains. You can build models for those. We even see density for four phospholipids and some of the ordered sugars on, on this active domain of nicastrin. Now, surprisingly, the active site of this protease complex was where the density was worst. It was rather fuzzy and something was going on. Probably this machine was occurring in different states and we were, we were mixing them together. Now, it, and it was then thanks to continuing developments in image classification that we now are able to also classify out these kind of, of, of differences. And we were able to separate out three different structures from the ensemble that give this high resolution structure. And just, for, just as an example, I will show you um, I will show you a movie. No? Can you switch the movie on? Do you have a mouse? Yeah, there we go. So this movie morphs from one of the states that we identify to the other states. And you can see that there is motion. There is actually a, a blue a cyan colored alpha helix which flicks in and out. And that's one of the catalytic aspartates lies on that helix. And that's the reason why the, the density in the catalytic active site was so fuzzy. And it might be functionally related to the fact that this protease is very promiscuous and also a very sloppy protease. And we're, we're still continuing to investigate this further. But it, from an image processing point of view, it's, I think it's very exciting. We can now separate structures which are actually chemically the same. So biochemical purification wouldn't bring you very far. And they only differ in the conformation of just a few alpha helices. OK, that brings me to my conclusion slide. Cryo-EM is progressing uh, very fast. 
New detectors and better image processing now make it possible to do near atomic resolution structures from many uh, different targets. Ribosomes are a lot easier than, than, than complexes, which are small, like gamma circuitry, smaller than 200 kilodalton, is still a bit hard. And I think very exciting, also with the point to the future, is that we can now start to deal with these different types of heterogeneity, where there's a mixture of different structures. Although there, more image processing development is, is necessary. For the field as a whole, continuing developments in, detector, uh, in detectors and sample preparation will also play very important rules, uh, very important roles in, in further improving this technique. And we, we firmly believe that it will become the main uh, structure determination technique in, in biology. That brings me to my acknowledgments. And I thought there were three people I'd like to highlight. I did my PhD at Utrecht University under the supervision of Piet Gross. Piet taught me that you should always work in science on problems that really matter, and he told me how to do so, so I'm, I'm grateful for that, Piet. He's sitting there. Uh, I then went to Jose Maria Carrazo's lab in, in Madrid, in, in Spain, and I'm very thankful because he suggested to me to work on the problem of uh, of, of classifying out different states with, with ticked peat box. And he then provided me with the environment and the resources to, to bring that project to a very fruitful end. And then I'm, I'm also very uh, grateful to uh, Richard Henderson for, for his role in getting me to the MRC in Cambridge and for his continuing advice uh, and help uh, f during the past few years. Now, I'm very grateful to the MRC, the UK Medical Research Council, for their very generous and very stable core funding, which allows us as an institute to hire the fantastic team of, team of, of facility people who keep up all the very expensive toys that we need to do this type of research. And I thank you for your attention. Josh. Congratulations, first of all. <laughs> Fantastic work. Uh, I'm sure we will see you back very soon for a plenary or keynote lecture <laughs> here at Chains again. Um, with that, I would like to uh, invite you all for lunch. Uh, please make sure you make use of the innovation market, career market, etc., and make sure you're back in time for the start of the program after lunch with the focus sessions. Thank you.